Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Franklin. I'm at the University of California at Riverside in the Department of Botany and Plant Sciences. So before I get started on my ENM 2020 lecture, uh, I want to mention that I'm sheltering at home like so many of you during the global pandemic and working from home. And so you'd think I'd be pretty good at uh, using Zoom and uh, online teaching technologies at this point, but this is actually the third time I've tried to record this lecture and I really hope it works this time. So I'm just I'm not gonna take any breaks. Uh, we're just going to uh, go through this. All right, so um, I would like to uh, share my screen. and uh, turn on my slides. All right, so I uh, am a professor of biogeography. My research addresses uh, how the dynamics of terrestrial plant communities are affected by uh, global change drivers. I've uh, been working in, oops, Right, I said I, I, I'm not stopping. I'm gonna get on the right slide here. All right, let's try again. Uh, I've uh, been asked to give an overview uh, of algorithms used in species distribution modeling and their relation to theory. Um, I have uh, been working on species distribution modeling since the early 1990s. I've written a book about species distribution modeling called mapping species distributions. Um, so I'll start with my framework for species distribution modeling in general, and then I will um, present a conceptual framework for uh, sort of classifying uh, or thinking about the algorithms used for uh, Im uh, implementing species distribution models. So Mike Austin published this framework remodeling species distributions in three parts. The ecological model underpinning uh, these empirical models, uh, and you've already discussed that in terms of niche theory. The data model, uh, and you've extensively discussed the both the species and the uh, environmental data used in species distribution modeling. And then the statistical model. So that's what this section of the course uh, is now focusing on. Within the uh, statistical uh, modeling component, uh, the way that I conceptualize uh, the many types of models used in species distribution modeling is using the framework uh, that was very nicely explained by uh, Trevor Hasty and his colleagues in their book, The Elements of Statistical Learning. Um, and uh, by the way, I believe they make this book available uh, online. Um, they use the term statistical learning, and you can see the subtitle is data mining inference and uh, prediction to describe advances in statistics, uh, applied statistics, modern regression, uh, and uh, so forth. Um, uh, as the world had turned from um, uh, one where st statistical analysis was, was done without a computer on small data sets and to analyze perhaps the uh, results of a designed experiment um, to a world where we have computers, uh, big data, uh, and a lot more computational power for learning from those data. So they describe um, a continuum of types of uh, statistical learning models. These range from models uh, like this that don't have a lot, make a lot of strong assumptions about um, the um, the data generating processes or the 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 form of the model being estimated. Um, uh, but learn from the data in a very simple way. Um, for example, the, the, uh, the k-nearest neighbor, neighbor classifier. In this example, the 
blue and gold circles represent observations of two different classes. Um, for example, this could be species presence and absence, and the X and Y axes represent two predictor variables, uh, so a two-dimensional um, data space. Um, in a k-nearest neighbor classifier, to classify a new um, uh, observation, uh, a combination of the values of the two predictor variables, um, you simply classify that combination of variables um, with respect to its nearest neighbors. You give it the same classification as its nearest neighbors. That could be its single nearest neighbor, resulting in this very irregular surface on the right, uh, sorry, left, uh, or the um, more of a smoothed boundary uh, by using the 15 nearest neighbors um, and uh, assigning based on the majority. Um, but in both cases, this class of model is said to have high variance. Uh, and k nearest neighbor classifiers are used in a lot of context, uh, such as remote sensing image processing with big data sets. Um, it's said to have high variance uh, because the, the rules don't uh, generalize very well. If you could draw another sample um, you know, from the same population of, for example, species and presences, presences and absences, um, these boundaries that were generated from the training data, if you will, are likely to make a lot of errors um, because the, uh, the rules are very um, closely fit to the data. So these are said to be data-driven models, but they have low bias. They don't have a lot of assumptions about the, what the form of that boundary or decision rule, classification rule is. At the other end of this continuum, we have the um, classic linear model uh, the, from that you've uh, probably learned about in an introductory statistics class that's illustrated here using linear discriminant analysis, uh, where the linear discriminant function uh, is um, fitted as a straight line uh, that's estimated using uh, least squares. Um, and so this type of model, uh, um, such as um, classical inferential statistical models, are said to have high bias because they have very strict assumptions, um, but they, uh, and, and so they're said to be more model driven. On the other hand, they uh, have low variance. Another sample uh, uh, from the same population would probably estimate um, a similar model, the same line. All right, so those are, so think of those as two ends of a continuum in terms of the algorithms used in species distribution modeling. Um, now in, um, uh, I'll start by talking about the framework or the steps in statistical model development, no matter what type of model you're using uh, in species distribution modeling. And this is, um, I believe this is bar borrowed from a paper uh, by Gisan. Uh, and his colleagues who talk about these steps of uh, model formulation, model estimation, and model evaluation. So formulation includes selecting the type of model you're going to use, the algorithm, um, which in large part is determined not only by your question, but by the nature of the data. So uh, this includes the measurement scale of the dependent variable, um, the measurement scale of the explanatory variables, and um, in the case of uh, the types of models with stronger assumptions, uh, uh, higher, higher bias, if you will, more model-driven, the um, distributions of those variables uh, and so forth have to be examined with respect to model assumptions such as normality uh, and independence. So we can make some generalizations about um, model formulation in, uh, in species distribution models based on the type of data that we have. Response variables are often binary, uh, species presence absence. They may, if they are more of a continuous measure of abundance, uh, they may be counts, which uh, 
are not typically normally distributed. They may be ordinal classes of, uh, of abundance. And um, another characteristic that's typical of species uh, occurrence data uh, or um, data about species distributions is that we, for um, rarer species, we tend to have very few observations. So even if you surveyed very many locations for many species, you'd have very few occurrences. And that really is another constraint on um, in terms of the size of your data set. In terms of predictors, we work in a world, as we've heard a lot about, with uh, potentially a lot of predictor variables, so multiple predictors. So we're working in a uh, multiple regression framework in a general sense, um, or a multivariate classification framework. So, Again, in um, models you, that have strong assumptions, there are, uh, we have to see if those are some assumptions are met and uh, concern ourselves with issues like multicollinearity among predictors, um, whether those predictors represent uh, direct or indirect gradients. Um, we may be dealing with mixed data types, uh, continuous and, um, categorical predictors uh, and, and, um, and uh, with multiple predictors, we then face something called the curse of dimensionality, uh, which I'll explain in the next slide. Um, so, uh, and in terms of ecological theory, uh, at least if our variables represent uh, more direct gradients, we actually have a theoretical expectation um, of the shape of the response function or the shape of the response curve. And it's not expected to be linear. Um, furthermore, um, in uh, an ecological world with multiple environmental factors affecting species distributions, we would probably expect there to be interactions between uh, the predictors or the explanatory variables. Um, so let me return to the curse of dimensionality. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have access to um, large numbers of uh, potential environmental uh, data for environmental predictors um, from climate to terrain to um, soils and so forth, um, uh, at least in my terrestrial plant world. Um, but here's the um, statistical issue when you have a lot of predictors. If you only had one predictor, a single variable representing the environmental gradient, then if you are able to sample 80% of the range of values in, your, uh, in the region um, for um, you know, species data, um, you would capture 80% of the, va the variance in that variable, in that predictor. Um, on the other hand, if you have, say, 10 predictors, um, if you sampled 80%, if you had enough locations to sample 80% of the range of values in each of those 10 dimensions, you would only be capturing 10% of that uh, hyper of that 10 dimensional hypervolume. Uh, so basically our, we may feel like we have a huge data set for species distribution modeling, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of observations. Uh, and yet those, uh, if you are using a lot of predictors, those become like stars in the universe. There's just mostly empty space between them and it uh, makes it very difficult to estimate um, model parameters, response surfaces, things like that. So the second step uh, in uh, uh, statistical modeling would then be model estimation or fitting. So this involves steps um, that you may be familiar with, like variable selection, characterizing and testing the significance of uh, interactions uh, between predictors, um, examining the shape of the uh, estimated parameters, uh, the response curve, in terms of ecological sensibility. Um, 
and, uh, and then evaluating model fit um, through any number of means such as variance explained, devi deviance explained. And then we were always taught to, to again, in the case of um, models with a lot of um, strong assumptions, high bias, to examine, for example, the distribution of residuals with respect to um, uh, model assumptions, that those are uh, independent, for example. All right, and so uh, with the higher um, variance types of models, the machine learning types of models, uh, uh, some of them are based on methods for either automating these steps um, or uh, bypassing them, if you will, because of the weaker assumptions. Yeah, so just to review, again, we don't, we don't necessarily expect uh, linear um, responses of uh, species uh, to environmental gradients. In fact, uh, niche theory suggests that those are probably unimodal, uh, maybe more complex, maybe even complex by multimodal uh, in the face of uh, competition and other species interactions within a community um, and, and, and may not be, and even if they're unimodal, they may not be symmetrical um, along an environmental gradient. They may expect, for example, ex be expected to be skewed depending on uh, if you're at a harsh or productive uh, end of a gradient. So we need models that can um, address this. All right, so with that as sort of a general uh, overview, we will um, go through the um, algorithms uh, used in supervised learning. And I've arranged them here according to how they're sort of logically arranged by Hasty et al. in their book. And they sort of move on this gradient from um, higher bias, more uh, stronger assumptions to um, higher variance, lower bias, but higher variance, um, more data-driven, uh, and therefore, you know, the implementation requires um, some ways of reducing that variance in order, order for those types of models to be useful. Uh, for any application. All right, so I am just going to uh, give a brief overview um, of a few of the uh, examples of a few of these uh, in order to um, uh, um, get you started, uh, get you ready for the rest of the lectures in this area that are in this section that will um, address some of these methods uh, and um, and tools for implementing them in greater detail. So I'll start with envelope and distance-based approaches. Um, these are um, fairly simple and straightforward, um, it, but you know, have been used in species distribution modeling. A big advantage of them is that they're based on descriptions of the values of the environmental variables for locations where a species has been recorded only. In other words, they only require presence data. They don't use absence or pseudo-absence or background data. So those models can either be based on uh, basically an envelope, ranges, or a distance, some measure of similarity um, to um, the observations of um, uh, where a species is found. Um, and so algorithms include um, BioClim, one of the original um, species distribution modeling methods, as well as data sets and software packages. And, um, other distance-based approaches such as Mahalanobis distance uh, and ecological niche factor analysis. So I'm just going to describe a couple of these. Um, envelope uh, methods uh, are things like um, box classifiers or convex hulls um, such as are implemented in BioClim. So if X1 and X2 are two uh, environmental variables and the Bs are observations of species B, uh, and the associated values of those environmental variables. If we literally just put a box around the highest and lowest values observed, um, we can then classify everything inside the box. Uh, any observation with values of those environmental variables falling inside the box as 
habitat and anything outside is not habitat. Um, this uh, can be refined a little bit uh, in the uh, uh, example of species A by um, drawing a bounding box um, that fits the data a little bit more closely. Um, so this is the approach originally implemented in BioClim, and we have so many uh, more options now that have uh, used in species distribution modeling and um, that are readily available and uh, that this is not used very much because it doesn't uh, tend to perform as well um, as other uh, algorithms. So distance-based approaches, again, only require presence data and uh, things like uh, the Mahalanobis distance, which have uh, uh, been applied in lots of other fields to multivariate data sets, are, have also been developed uh, for species distribution modeling. Uh, so Mahalanobis distance is simply a distance uh, that accounts for the correlation among the um, predictors by scaling uh, differences in the mean uh, by the covariance. So as shown in the graph, if X1 and X2 are again two environmental predictors, if the yellow cloud is related to a bunch of species occurrences um, and mu is uh, the mean uh, in, the, in each dimension uh, of that, the mean value, so that's treated as sort of the optimal value for habitat. Um, so if we just measure the Euclidean distance uh, to that uh, point in this uh, two-dimensional space, then A and B are the same Euclidean distance from the center. So we'd say they had the same habitat suitability or degree of agreement bet uh, between, uh, with optimal conditions. Uh, however, if we account for the collinearity between these two variables, um, and, and using the variance covariance matrix uh, in the bottom graph, A and B are at the same Mahalanobis distance from the center. Um, so this has been used uh, successfully in species, oops, sorry, in species distribution modeling. Um, it has um, some drawbacks. The predictors are equ equally weighted um, and then um, we are still, we have to assume a normal error distribution. So it has a lot of strong assumptions, higher bias. It only considers linear responses, and you can only use um, quantitative or continuous, continuous predictors. So moving to uh, the next stage, we can talk about linear methods for uh, regression and classification. Uh, linear methods for classification are, I've already illustrated with linear discriminant analysis. Um, so I'll talk about um, the classic linear model uh, that you probably learned about in statistics uh, and uh, how that has been uh, modified um, as the generalized linear model, how it's been generalized uh, in ways that it can better accommodate the kinds of data and problems we have in species distribution modeling, um, as well as in lots of other um, fields. So um, the linear model uh, looks like this. Um, e sub y is the expected value of uh, y, the response variable, um, as a function of um, x sub j is the vector of estimate, or x sub j is the vector of values of the predictor variable, uh, and um, beta sub j is the vector of uh, estimated coefficients, beta hat. Um, beta hat zero is the estimated uh, intercept, and um, epsilon is the error term. So in the linear model, uh, again, as you probably all learned, the error term is normally distributed uh, is with zero mean and constant variance. And the variance of y is constant across um, uh, the, the range of observations. So this is that strong uh, assumption uh, of IID um, independently and identically distributed. Um, the generalized linear model, um, the, on the right side of the equation, the right side of the equation it looks, it is exactly the same as in the linear model, but then that is related to the linear predictor. 
Um, so the predictor variables are combined to produce a linear predictor. Um, and the betas are estimated um, based on this part of the equation. But then the expected value of y is um, uh, related to the linear predictor through a link function. So it's shown here as g. Okay, so the expected value of y is related to the linear predictor through the link function. Um, this allows, um, the link function allows us to, um, we can use different link functions for uh, y's, for uh, response variables that have different, have distributions other than Gaussian, um, which is the assumption in the linear model, as long as they're within the family of exponential distributions. So that would include binomial, uh, which suits binary data very well, or Poisson, um, which suits count data very well, um, as well as others like gamma. Um, so depending on the nature of our response variable, we can use a link function that's related to uh, one of these other uh, distributions. All right, let me back up one slide. Um, so that the generalized linear model um, uh, gives us flexibility there. Um, we, we can also um, include, um, uh, um, we can also characterize nonlinear response functions if they're explicitly, um, uh, if they're included explicitly in the formula, for example, as higher order polynomial terms uh, for the x's, so x plus x squared um, as separate uh, terms or uh, e even higher order polynomials. So then we can characterize, for example, uh, unimodal response curves as well um, in uh, for species distribution modeling. All right, so the link function describes how the um, mean of y is dependent on the linear predictor. So if the response is binary, the binom binomial distribution is used to describe the distribution of y. The logit link function is the log odds ratio of the probabilities of those binary classes, classes zero and one. Then we can inverse transform the linear predictor. So, so the predicted values from the linear predictor, for example, of a logistic regression are on the log odds scale, uh, that, that um, logit scale or that log odds, uh, the, ra the ratio. Um, of the two classes, the probability of the two classes. So an inverse transform can be applied to the linear predictor in order to predict the values on the response scale in the units of the response variable. In the case of uh, species presence absence or a logistic model, that would be on the scale of zero to one. So the predictions, if they're transformed, would uh, range between zero and one and are often interpreted as a probability. Um, so um, yeah, but this allows the model to a model to be estimated that is linear in the terms. Um, all right, and then uh, from from there, if we move from uh, the, the linear model, which still has um, fairly strong um, bi high bias, uh, but um, a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of uh, data types and, and data distributions more than the linear model. Um, then we begin to move towards the uh, machine learning or non-parametric or quasi-parametric, um, they've been called a lot of things, methods. So I'm going to um, discuss generalized additive models as kind of being the transitional model because it's the generalized additive model looks a lot like the generalized linear model, um, except that the betas uh, have been replaced by some smoothing function, f. And in fact, it could be a mixture of you know, betas estimated using a GLM and smoothing terms. So typically, this smoothing term is a scatter plot smoother that's taking some type of weighted local average of the data, for example, uh, using uh, cubic lines. So to illustrate this, um, if we have uh, four different predictor variables shown here, uh, and uh, on the x axis and on the y axis, we have the log odds ratio 
um, of uh, species presence absence for a particular species, uh, we can use the scatter plot. We can look at the distribution of presences and absences along this uh, uh, gradient or you know, along this range of values, uh, and we can uh, estimate the response uh, using the scatter plot smoother. So this is very flexible for identifying nonlinear responses uh, that we often expect in ecological data and for characterizing them. Um, however, again, this has higher variance uh, than uh, a GLM. Uh, it can tend to uh, overfit the, the data used to generate the model and not be a very robust predictive tool. So um, again, keeping this in mind, as you move towards the machine learning uh, end of the spectrum or the, um, the um, high variance end of the spectrum, there are tools in the implementation of any of these um, models in order to try to keep that variance down and make more robust predictive models. So I'll show here this um, graphic from this uh, wonderful classic paper by Gison and Zimmerman that was comparing different methods for used in species distribution modeling. Because uh, uh, this illustrates very nicely these, the differences between the models we've been talking about if we look at the GLM versus GAM. Uh, a GLM fit with a second order polynomial for these two predictors, X and Y. Uh, estimates the response as this Gaussian shaped curve. And so the response surface in two dimensions is a, sort of a symmetrical hill, if you will. GAMs allow you to uh, estimate uh, a curve that is asymmetrical, even multimodal. And uh, in this case, it is sort of an ace, it, the response surface is sort of an asymmetrical hill. Um, and then we can compare that to the envelope methods down here in D, um, where again, it's very simple. It's, it's simply a bounding box and you're either in or you're out and there's sort of no degree of uh, similarity or um, membership or whatever. So we um, uh, illustrated here a couple, a few other methods that I'm not gonna discuss in such detail. The decision tree type methods uh, are, um, based on recursive partitioning of the data, um, dividing the data into um, categories of the response variable based on thresholds of the explanatory variables, sort of one at a time. So this is a um, hierarchical method. And as you uh, develop the decision rules, uh, each set of uh, new set of decision rules is actually based on a subset of the data. So it's, it's spoken of as being not a, um, global model, but more of a local model, looking, uh, developing classification rules on uh, local uh, areas of the data in, um, in measurement space. Um, also shown here is CCA, an ordination technique used for community or multi-species data, multi so uh, multivariate technique, um, and also Bayesian methods. Um, so um, the remainder of the classific uh, algorithms uh, that um, in, you know, the Hasty and uh, colleagues' table of contents in their book uh, would be the more um, data-driven, um, high-variance machine learning type of uh, models or classifiers. So that would include neural networks, artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, uh, things like support vector mach machines, and, and other approaches, as well as uh, multivariate approaches. Um, uh, some recent ones being developed would be the joint species distribution models when you have data that, um, uh, community data that um, gives you information on more, more than one species. Um, and then finally, model averaging or model um, uh, ensemble approaches can be used to um, average, um, you know, some type of weighted average um, between uh, models based on different algorithms. So again, I should point out that there are um, approaches that basically um, do ensemble modeling that develop multiple models as part of the modeling process. So that, that would be thing, 
things like the boosting and uh, bagging approaches to uh, decision tree modeling, uh, things like uh, booster regression trees in random forests, uh, actually, um, I'm oversimplifying this, but they basically build lots of models with the data set, um, keeping each one fairly simple, uh, but when you combine the predictions, uh, they tend to produce very robust models. Um, so again, I will conclude with the, um, the whole uh, table of contents or the whole continuum of algorithms uh, uh, used for supervised learning, and including in the species distribution modeling domain, and show that they again range from those with stronger assumptions um, uh, about uh, data distributions and so forth, um, uh, therefore higher bias um, to those with higher variance uh, and that are very data driven. And um, uh, those ones uh, in their implementation, uh, implementation has to be done carefully in order to um, reduce that bias and uh, develop um, robust uh, predictive models. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll conclude, and I hope you have uh, are looking forward to uh, the other lectures in this unit uh, on algorithms as much as I am. Thank you. <laughs>